Uh, before beginning the presentations, I want to give uh, some brief context for risk informing as a process. It's using risk information, both qualitative and quantitative, to help focus designs, approaches, and reviews consistent with safety significance. NRC has a long history of conducting probabilistic risk assessments to support its safety mission. Uh, it's important to note that it's not a static process. Risk information uh, and risk informing activities will continue to evolve as operational experience and information grows. Uh, there's really two aspects to risk import, risk informing. One certainly is the development of this risk information and the collection of experience and data to help one understand the risk significance. But the other is, well, what do you do with that information? If you just collect the information and didn't do anything with it, it really wouldn't be risk informing. And so today's presentations, we will be talking to both of these aspects, uh, both the development and the understanding of risk information, as well as, well, how is it implemented, say, for a regulatory agency for the, at the NRC in terms of reaping the benefits of the risk information? Next slide, please. Okay, probabilistic risk studies continue to provide quantitative analysis of dry cast storage. Past studies have shown the resilience of dry cast storage designs to a wide range of potential accidents, uh, including loading operations. Uh, some of these documented studies uh, are, were conducted more than 10 years ago. EPRI conducted a study uh, in 2004 for a bolted cask. NRC did a study later, a uh, pilot study that looked at welded uh, canisters. Uh, the DSC for the Department of Energy and the Yucca Mountain application did some analysis of uh, storage systems on aging pads. And so there's, there's, a, there's information out there. Uh, but it's also important, as I mentioned, this is not a static process. Can, information continues to grow. It's important to critically evaluate those initial risk studies, uh, update the assessments with uh, further modeling activities, experience and information. Uh, NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research is doing that just that today. There's a level three PRA that will update some of this earlier uh, risk assessment work that NRC did. Uh, Brian Wagner will be talking about this and this, as well as other initiatives to enhance NRC's risk information. Uh, additionally, uh, Zeta Martin will be making a presentation that looks at operational risks and the experience she brings to the table in terms of the uh, uh, activities and risks associated with uh, dry cast storage. That's the first part of the element of risk informing. You have to develop and have an experience base. Next slide, please. But next it's, well, what are you gonna do with that information? Uh, it's just as important to how do we fold that into uh, the regulatory process? Uh, there's some recent active initiatives at the NRC for risk informing that have been undertaken as pilot programs. First, there was a, with the assistance of Idaho National Laboratories, a risk tool was developed to assist the development of risk information in dry cast storage amendment reviews. Uh, NRC has also conducted a pilot program to use risk insights in a graded approach to ensure the information in an amendment is appropriate placed in either the license or the final safety analysis report to ensure there's an appropriate and necessary regulatory oversight. It depends on where it is. It gives different flexibilities for uh, the use of that information. Uh, 
These pilot programs uh, have been conducted in cooperation and input, certainly from the industry. I would never want to suggest NRC is doing this in isolation. We also conduct public meetings to assist the input from all stakeholders. Uh, but there's also uh, another aspect of these initiatives where uh, industry-led efforts. Uh, NEI submitted a white paper to the NRC on looking at defining spent fuel performance safety margins that provides the industry perspective on the, on the experience with loading and maintenance of dry cast spent nuclear fuel storage and transportation uh, systems with an, a goal to improve the regulatory framework for licensing these systems. Rod McCollum from NEI, the Nuclear Energy Institute, will provide some industry perspectives related to that white paper, but also perspectives on these types of initiatives that have occurred since that paper was submitted in 2019. Topical reports are also an example of another approach for risk informing NRC's ever involving program. Kim Mamzion will close our presentations with perspectives on the use of risk information in development of topical reports. So you can see today we're, we're going to talk to both aspects, both development of information and use of that information. Next slide. The panel represents a wide range of perspectives and experience for dry cast storage. Uh, I think the discussions today benefit from this wide variety of perspectives with a common goal of ensuring reasonable assurance of adequate protection that benefits both the NRC and all stakeholders. Uh, so as, as a brief introduction, Brian Wagner, uh, as I mentioned, is, is an NRC employee in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. He's a uh, reliability and risk engineer uh, and specializes in topics related to risk informing spent fuel storage in transportation. Our second speaker will be Rod McCollum, who has been working on regulatory uh, issues at NEI since 1998, but has over 35 years of experience in nuclear engineering, licensing, management, regulatory policy, policy experience. Uh, currently, he leads industry efforts to reduce business risks associated with uh, used fuel management, commercial nuclear power plant decommissioning, emergent material degradation issues, and a variety of topics. He brings a lot of experience to the table. Next, Zeta Martin, who recently retired as the Senior Spent Fuel Program Manager for the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA. Uh, in, this, in her role there, she was responsible for developing and ensuring program implementation of TVA spent fuel management strategies. Zeta has over 42 years of experience working in the nuclear power industry, dealing with all types, uh, aspects of nuclear fuel, fabrication and design, fuel and core performance, criticality, heat load analyses, and wet and dry storage. And finally, Kim Manzion is the licensing manager for Holtec International. She is responsible for all of Holtec's licensing actions, for spent fuel storage and transportation casts, both domestically and internationally. She is responsible for super supervising the preparation and engineering change documentation to support client activities and whole, and whole tech manufacturing facilities. Kim has over 14 years of experience in the nuclear power industry. And all this wealth of experience and different views brings to the table good discussion we hope will follow because it's, it's a benefit that everyone has different perspectives, different viewpoints, bringing that information to the table to risk inform for that common goal of adequate safety is critically important to the NRC. And without further ado, uh, I want to stop my introduction and we'll lead off with our first presenter, Brian Wagner. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. 
Uh, as Tim mentioned, my name is Brian Wagner. I'm a reliability and risk engineer in the Division of Risk Analysis in the Office of Nuclear Research at the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, we can go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about um, some of the challenges and benefits to risk-informing dry casks. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of background on risk-informing at the NRC, specifically for the dry cask area. I'll talk about some of the benefits and challenges, uh, as well as some current research that we're doing. Um, next slide. Okay, background. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of these in detail. I'm just going to kind of give a, a sampling of some of these documents. Uh, the first category is, is guidance. There's been a number of um, policy and plans to increase the use of information in the regulatory framework at the NRC. Um, the first one I want to mention is the PRA policy statement that we put out in 1995, which basically says to, um, it was commission direction that the agency should increase the use of risk in all regulatory matters to the extent practicable. Um, we produced a, uh, we call it the RITM document, which is uh, risk informed decision making for nuclear materials and waste applications. And that was guidance to help staff apply a uh, risk-informed um, approach for regulatory decision-making. That was back in 2008. And then uh, most recently here is New Reg 2150, which I, I don't have the title there, but it's a proposed risk management regulatory framework. And it provides a, a kind of strategic vision and options for adopting more risk-informed regulatory framework. So, you know, we, we've been looking for opportunities. I, I'm sorry, I meant to mention 2150 was uh, not just reactors, it tried to include kind of all purviews of the NRC, including um, waste and casks and, and, and all those things. So we've been looking for opportunities to risk inform dry casks for a while. Um, and, you know, we, we made some progress in some areas and we're trying to keep moving the ball forward with that. Um, and there's been a number of, I think to mention these briefly, uh, a couple of uh, dry cask risk studies. The first category is transportation. There's been really two major risk studies for that. The first was performed by the NRC, um, published in 2007, which was New Reg 1864. Um, that was considered a, a pilot dry cask PRA to kind of showcase methodology that could be used for potential future dry cask PRAs where they performed. Um, and then at the same time, around the same time, EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, was also working on dry cast PRA. Uh, to some degree, they were meant to be complementary efforts. Um, one looked at a PWR, one looked at a BWR, one looked at a welded cask, one looked at a bolted cask. So they, you know, they, they had largely consistent results, although they were somewhat different. Um, additionally, we performed a number of transportation risk assessments. The, the NRC has been doing that every 10 years or so. Um, first one I got there is back in 1977. Um, and then there's been four of them, uh, most recently in 2014. Uh, they all found transportation risks to be, you know, acceptably low. The newer studies use some updated methods um, and calculated lower risks from accidents, although uh, similar doses from um, regular operation. Uh, next slide. Okay, I want to talk about some of the, the benefits to risk informing dry cask reviews. And, and basically, it's the same benefits, the, the same kinds of benefits as risk informing reactors um, or anything else for that matter. Um, the, you know, the, these previous dry cask PRAs have generally found the risks to be low, um, which is to say, you, you know, spent fuel is dangerous and there's a lot of spent fuel in these casks, but if properly managed, the, the risks can be low. Um, and this raises the possibility that there might be additional margin um, that we can take advantage of uh, in, in risk informing, um, which means that we can maybe reduce the regulatory burden on some less risk significant aspects and focus on the more risk significant aspects. 
so we don't really need to focus on the areas with with low risk and also have low uncertainty. We can focus on the areas that have high risk or maybe higher uncertainty in the results. Uh, and an advantage of PRA is is that it's a, a systematic um, systematic process, which really creates a framework that you can do a lot of things with. You can identify some of the more um, risk significant aspects, um, which are maybe areas where you want additional data and additional analysis. Uh, you can more easily test the importance of some of your assumptions. Um, once you have this framework, once you've you know done the math, it's easier to input different assumptions, add failure mechanisms, and and see what the the results of that would be. Um, and it gives you a framework to evaluate the significance of additional, like new failure mechanisms. Um, and we actually have an example, we'll talk about an example of that later, but we're trying to do that. And so most of these benefits, you know, they're, they're benefits of PRA, they're not necessarily unique to PRA. Um, some of it is just having a systematic process. Um, next slide. So there's some challenges to realizing these benefits. Um, the the previous dry cask PRAs that have been done, they they have a number of limitations in uh, data, scope, what types of casks were considered. So you really need to be mindful of those limitations um, when attempting to use this risk information. You, you need to make sure that the uh, insights from those studies really apply to the situation that you're looking at. Um, and kind of one example of that is, you know, when you like look at the reactor con context, there's some components that are just so plentiful in so many reactors and running for so long that you, you really just have data. You don't, you almost don't need to model some of these things. Some of these things like, you know, pumps and valves, we simply just collect data. So then even some things that would be uncertainties, even some unknown unknowns, just get revealed in the data. And I'm kind of thinking of like corrosion and some aging mechanisms where maybe you didn't know that was a failure mechanism, but it's just it's just happened over and over. So you just have data on it. Whereas, um, at, at least to some degree, um, whereas that's less true for casks. There's just fewer casks. They haven't been around for as long. Um, you load each of them once. So there's definitely some areas, and it's not completely unique, but there's some areas where you just don't have the same level of data uh, and you need to be a little more, little more careful with uh, some of your unknowns and uncertainties. Um, there's, there's some you know, areas where we don't have as much failure data or as much uh, analytical data. One example is the behavior of fuel or accident conditions um, and some of these very low probability events. There's just not great data in some of those areas and that can be a challenge. Uh, and when data is lacking, PRAs tend to use generic analyses or conservative analyses. Um, and that can be, that can kind of skew, skew your results, particularly if you have inconsistent conservatisms. So you got to be careful with that, particularly when you're ranking the, uh, looking at the relative ranking of risks compared to each other. Uh, you know, you got to be careful. If one risk is kind of high, but it's modeled conservatively. Um, compared to another one. Uh, also, a lot of these calculations are, you know, some of them are not necessarily done probabilistically all the way through. So you need to be, particularly with the conservative um, assumptions, you need to be careful of kind of cliff edge effects in your success criteria calculations, where, you know, if you're just over the line or just under the line, it, it makes a huge difference. If the cask is not breached, you know, the risk is, you know, extremely low or zero, where if it is breached, it's um, at least fractionally much higher than that. Uh, so you need to be careful of those sorts of things and, and really make sure that your assumptions are, are robust for the situations that you're looking at. Um, so the worker protection, this is more of a caution than a challenge, really. It's, it's just that you know, worker risk is not usually included in PRAs. It's, it's usually just out of scope. And we have to be a little careful about that with casks because the, the consequences tend to be a lot lower than we're used to for reactors. 
Um, but there are some cases where, like for a drop event, the, the release might happen very quickly. And there's often, for some of these, um, some of these processes, a lot of workers almost right next to the cask. So th there could be cases where, you know, you calculate the risk off-site and it can be extremely low, but that doesn't mean that there's not perhaps a significant risk to the workers. So we have to, as we do these things, you know, we need to be careful um, that we're continuing to protect workers in the process. Um, and I don't have a list on here, but of course, a, a challenge is cost. It's not free to risk inform. Um, you got to develop the risk information, the processes, et cetera. And that just takes, it takes time, it takes effort. And in some cases, it's going to be worth that time and effort. And in some cases, it's not. Um, and, and of course, there's not as much money flying around for dry casks as there is for like reactors. So, you, you know, it's not always going to be feasible to spend tens of millions of dollars doing analysis um, unless there's really going to be the benefit there. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to talk a little about some current research. Um, the first one is this level three PRA project. This is a, a pretty big project. Um, it's the full scope comprehensive site level three PRA. Um, you know, it's perhaps unfortunate naming because it's a level three PRA, but what we really mean is it's all PRA levels, levels one, two, and three, uh, which is to say it considers all the way from initiating events through fuel damage, through offsite release to offsite consequences. Um, and it also includes all major, major radiological sources at the site. So a lot of previous PRAs are just initiating events for the reactor. Um, this includes um, for the reactor at power. Uh, th this includes low power shutdown, it includes spent fuel pool, and it includes uh, dry casks being stored, loaded and stored at the reactor. Uh, so it's significantly increased scope uh, compared to a lot of um, previous PRAs. So this work was directed by the commission um, in an SRM to SECI 110089 back in 2011. So we've been working on this for over 10 years now, um, especially considering the, the pre-work we did before that. And we have a number of objectives for this project. Um, we want to reflect some technical advan advances that have occurred since we uh, published New Reg 1150, which was, I think, all the way back in 1990. Um, we've got new scope considerations, as I mentioned, the pools and dry cast storage. And we, we want to get new updated insights out of it. Um, a lot's changed in the industry in the last 30 years. Um, and we want to see how that, that hashes out in a probabilistic risk analysis. Um, and, and to see, you know, with these new uh, scope considerations, see how the risks compare to each other to a degree. You know, how reactors at power compare to low power, compared to spent fuel pools, compared to dry cask. Um, another goal is just to maintain and enhance the PRA capability of the staff at the NRC um, and to a lesser extent at the, the various labs and contractors that are helping us with it. Um, next slide. So, all right, so for the, the dry cask portion of the level 30 PRA model, we, you know, we started with the, the methods in New 1864, the previous dry cask um, pilot, pilot dry cask PRA. And we updated the model here is that we thought would benefit from improvements. Um, one example is we wanted to look at detailed event identification, uh, particularly given that there's less of a knowledge base for uh, dry cask PRAs. We, we really want to make sure that we were capturing everything to look at um, in the first place. So we did a um, hazard and operability analysis, a HAZOP, to, to really try to you know, do a thorough job of identifying initiating events and, and just positioning them in some way, even if it's to be screened. Um, we did initial analysis for some sequences, um, particularly with significant scenarios. Uh, we screened some others. So we just wanted to refine that in some areas. We did some additional structural analysis because that was an area that was found to be pretty high risk. Well, um, one of the higher risks in 1864, I won't say high risk, but so we really drilled it on that event and did some additional structural analysis there. We 
enhanced and reevaluated the consequence model. Uh, that, that's previously been identified several times as a pretty major source of uncertainty for dry casks. Just, and it's, it's of course important. There's, uh, at least in principle, there's a lot of material that is actually in the cask. So you really want to know how much of that might be able to get out. Um, so that, that's something we really drilled into a lot more uh, than we had in some previous analyses. So the results were, we found general consistency with some previous uh, drug cast PRA is a somewhat different mix of the contributions to that risk. Um, we, you know, expect this to give insight on um, what information we have and what additional information we can benefit from. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned in the, the benefits of risk-informing dry casks is having the, the, the model and the updated analyses really gives us a basis for doing additional analysis sensitivities, considering new events. Um, ha having the model to kind of plug those in, into. And the status is we, we've pretty much finished the technical work. Um, there's a few things that were you know, responding to comments and things, but we're largely done. So the report's being reviewed and we're hoping to release a, a draft publicly uh, later this year. Next slide. The next big thing that we're doing, um, which I guess isn't purely a research effort, but it's developing the, the risk tool um, and job aid. The really, really goal of this is to use risk information to focus license reviews um, on the areas that are going to have higher risk significance rather than the areas that might have some lower risk significance. The, uh, so we worked with a, a contractor, Idaho National Laboratories. Um, they developed the actual risk tool um, report, which is publicly available um, in our agency-wide document management system under the accession number I've given here. Um, and it consists of, of two pieces. There's a tree dry diagram, which gives a preliminary estimation of the risks. Um, it's organized by component uh, and is color coded. Um, I'll show a picture of it on the next slide. And then the, the rationale document, that's you know why um, it, it was given that risk significance. And, and this information is pulled from you know, previous risk studies, safety margin investigations, um, some safety evaluation reports, and input from NRC technical reviewers. So the, the status of this is, um, oh, and additionally, there's a, a job aid that provides uh, instructions for using the risk tool. Um, we've been doing some pilot applications with this. We're reviewing insights from those. Um, and we're continuing discussions about how to integrate this into our processes and how to use this information. Um, next slide. I, you know, I, I understand you're not going to be able to see this really. It's just to give you an idea of what the risk tool report looks like. Uh, on the left is the cover page. The top right is the, the tree diagram. Um, so you can kind of see what the structure looks like. It's organizing things by component um, and color coding the risk significance. And then the bottom right is the rationale. So there's just text there. Next slide, last slide. Uh, so yeah, this is an area where we're trying to kind of use some of these insights and models. Um, it's, we're looking at risk informing uh, consideration of chloride induced stretch corrosion cracking, CISCC. And there's, there's several aspects of this project. Um, only some of it is risk informing it. So we're looking at um, enhancing the staff's understanding of the technical issues key to successfully managing CISCC. Um, we want to look at you know, what parameters are really affecting the growth rates um, from CISCC. We want to look at mitigation repair methods. And, and then there's the risk informing piece. Uh, this just recently started. So the, the first step that we're working on now is reviewing existing risk information, what sequences are relevant to CISCC. Um, and then we want to evaluate, based on those results, we want to evaluate uh, 
which risk sequences that exist in current PRAs are, are relevant to CISCC, how CIS, which one CISCC might affect. Um, and then depending on how it goes, next year we're planning on doing some probabilistic assessment. Um, not a full PRA, not a full probabilistic risk assessment, but just some probabilistic analyses um, to, you know, to, to see um, how CISCC might affect these sequences and what, what the risk looks like. And, and the, the point of all this is to have some kind of risk-based, um, yeah, risk information to inform what the inspection frequencies are. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I believe we have some polling questions uh, that if we could go to them uh, would be useful. And our IDM is risk-informed decision-making uh, in terms of implementing that at the NRC. Well, I see uh, a strong push for we need to do more. Certainly there isn't anything at, it has not done enough. <laughs> So, it's always good to get perspectives and it, it, it's, uh, I like the strong support, support for uh, uh, doing more in terms of risk-informed decision-making. Oh. Okay, if we could go to the next question. This is sort of the same question, but directed more at the industry. Uh, the next question. Seems like that was similar to both NRC and industry. Uh, have you used a risk informed uh, as far as as far as an official technical process? Uh, that's good to see. Uh, at least close to 50%, uh, possibly yes. It's bouncing around. And then a, I believe the, the last polling question at this point. You know, did the risk-informed decision-making process uh, result in a different outcome than you expected? Well, okay, and then I think there's one last one, uh, possibly. Yes. Uh, 
sort of opinion is, is the nuclear industry safer today? Well, strong views uh, going for yes. Uh, well, th thank you for participating in, in, in those polling questions. Uh, always interesting to see uh, other views. Uh, with that, let's we'll go to our next presentation, which is Rod McCollum from the Nuclear Energy Institute. Uh, Thank you, Tim. I hope everyone can hear me. If I can get a thumbs up from one of my other uh, panelists, okay, head nods work too. Um, and good to see you again, Tim. I, um, I'm out here at the uh, Waste Management Conference in Phoenix, Arizona, where uh, we are having some of the same repository geology discussions that you and I used to have back in the day. And I can, I'm pleased to inform you that uh, geologists are still rock stars. So, um, <laughs> uh, and, and I, I think that um, also I want to I want to um, uh, compliment uh, Brian for shedding some light on the risk tool. We think that is important. Uh, we think risk informing is is important in this area, particularly, and and so we're looking forward to seeing more visibility on that. Looked like you had some. Uh, some cool screens that you can you can share and, and explain your decision making processes there. So that's probably a um, good use of technology. Um, I will warn everybody uh, that um, this entire presentation is a metaphor. So I will uh, welcome your challenging questions at the end to try to uh, poke holes in the metaphor to work work on how things fit within the metaphor. Uh, my presentation is entitled safety focus, not risk informing. And that's with a purpose because improved safety focus is what you get when you successfully risk inform, uh, when you uh, risk inform a process. So, um, you know, that that's why we are doing this. Um, and uh, I will tell you, uh, it may be as an incentive to stick around to the end of my presentation. I, I will explain why this is important uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, and I, I was glad also to hear, uh, Tim, you mentioned experience base being important to risk informing. And Brian, uh, you talked about the importance of having enough data. Uh, I, I, would, I would suggest that um, uh, in dry cast storage, yes, on both accounts. Uh, since 1986, we've accumulated uh, a, a massive experience base. We, in over 36 years, we've loaded 3,600 casks. That's kind of an interesting coincidence in the, in the numbers there. Uh, and, and, and we've done so and we've been very safe and we continue to be very safe. And now that those casks have been out there a while, we continue to innovate and drive safety improvements in our aging management technologies. So um, this area is ripe for risk informing. We have data, we have an experience base so um, let's uh, jump into the metaphor, if we can have the next slide. So uh, this is a very crude representation of perhaps an aperture like on a camera. Uh, it works differently than a camera. Um, you see the, uh, the, the three primary uh, things we do to make sure we're safe here. Uh, one is regulation. Um, and of course, that has to be the circle closest to safety. None of the other circles, uh, neither of the other circles can get inside or on top of regulation because that would mean we would be doing something less than the regulation. So you, you, what, that is the minimum level of protection. Uh, and and uh, then um, the next level is the licensing basis. We must negotiate our licensing basis and that's what a licensing process is, a negotiation. So that not only is it, um, outside of or bigger than, it's, it's within the regulation, but it's an outside circle. So maybe the metaphor falls already, but uh, it needs to be more than the uh, regulation. Um, it's both thicker and uh, extends farther out. <clears throat> so um, then the third circle is our own licensee controls and procedures. Uh, they certainly have to comply with our licensing base and the regulations. They can't get on top of those circles either. The space you see, the space you see in between the circles is what I would call margin. And this is the thing we've been, and, and, and Brian and Tim, you alluded to these, we've been working on the performance margins. 
uh, and trying to, as you get more data and your experience base sharpens, you, you can indeed shrink these margins. Um, the thickness of the outer circles grows as you put more and more things under licensee control. Um, we have not seen a need to change the regulation. 10 CFR Part 72 and Part 71 work pretty well. Uh, NRC reaffirmed recently Part 71 um, uh, in the uh, transportation readiness assessment. So we, we've got a really good regulation. It, it, it's a performance-based regulation, which is why that circle is not as thick as the other two. Um, and, but we still have plenty of margin in our licensing bases and in the other things we do. So um, again, it, as, as we use our experience base to tighten these circles, to bring them closer together, to strengthen the outer circles, so we're relying less on just the regulation, um, that's how we become safer. That's how we improve our safety focus. So the, uh, the lens on the camera, you're, you're focusing the lens on the camera, you're tightening the aperture. And so if we can go further into the metaphor now on the next slide, or you, you'll see two things uh, coming up, uh, guidance and rulemaking. Again, you can bring the regulation uh, in tighter with rulemaking, but we, we don't suggest doing that in drive storage. We, we like the regulation we have. Um, guidance, both from the NRC and, and as Brian alluded to, uh, from industry at times. Um, we can also bring the circles closer together. Now, I'm not moving the circles physically, first of all, I don't want to make you dizzy with my poor PowerPoint skills. And, 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 and second of all, I think this is in the eye of the beholder. I, I'd like you all to be thinking about how you see this space between the circles uh, and, and, and what we can do to get these circles closer together um, in, in, um, in, making, in improving our safety focus uh, and, and in, in strengthening the licensee controlled circles. So going on to the next slide, I think we took a big step with the performance margin tools. Um, we, we've, we've done pilots, we've done PERTs, which is uh, these phenomenal, uh, in, in, oh, I forgot the I, risk ranking tools. In other words, we figure out between the experts what's important. And um, so we have, we have really uh, tightened the circles a lot with the performance margin tools. So the risk tool is one of the things that came out of the performance margin effort. The goal of the performance margin effort was to understand what's in these margins to, to tighten these circles, to, to you know, not have excess margin, which causes us to lose our safety focus. If you're thinking way out to the, to the sides of the rings instead of in the, the, the red prize in the center, um, you know, again, your safety focus is blurring. The camera is going out of focus. So uh, the, the performance margin tools, uh, if we use them smartly, we can tighten these circles. Uh, and, and again, the thickness, I would ask you to envision the thickness of the uh, licensee control circle is expanding as we do this. A, a big goal of most of the performance margin efforts uh, was to get more information under licensee control, either in the licensing basis, expanding the thickness of that circle, the protectiveness of that circle, or even beyond the licensing basis. And uh, NRC's risk tool goes hand in hand with that because NRC is now also tailoring its reviews. What information do you need to review based on the risk significance, based on NRC's understanding of the performance margin, which again, uh, after 3,600 casts in 36 years, we, we do have a very, we have the ability to sharpen the focus. We have the ability, we know what we need to know to tighten the aperture here. So we, we look forward to a lot of things on the NRC side continuing to sharpen our focus, to continuing to tighten the aperture here so we can be both safer and more efficient. Uh, the dry cast storage safety record is, is, is really impressive. So it uh, makes it an idea. However, uh, when we were making great progress on the, um, through the margins effort in sharpening our focus on safety and tightening these circles, we had, uh, we, we, we start to see inspection findings and in, in RAIs that still are not safety significant. Hopefully the risk tool uh, addresses the non-safety significant RAIs. Uh, and I will here allude to, and quite honestly, to the short-term operations tornado scenario. We have been working on this. It's not safety significant. Everyone in NRC and industry agrees it's not safety significant. NRC has repeatedly said is there's no need to delay loading. What the short-term tornado issue is, is when we load a dry cask, we move from a position that is analyzed for tornado missile impact inside a building typically 
to another position that is analyzed uh, for tornado missile impacts out on the Isfasi pad. Um, and as we make that journey with those crawlers and cranes and, you know, uh, putting lids on and, and, and all that, um, we do pass through for short periods of time. Uh, in these periods of time, configurations where we do not uh, have a tornado missile analysis. Uh, the generic issue for industry here, and, and this has been consistent with the way our licensing bases were constructed over the last 36 years, is, is that we don't need a tornado missile impact for every single configuration uh, that we go through. That would be a tremendous expenditure of, of, um, of resources, uh, and it wouldn't lead us to do anything different. Um, but nevertheless, we continue to discuss this issue. Uh, there continues to be a lack of agreement and alignment on what really the licensing basics mean here. Um, we've been at this for five months. I, I can tell you, I have never seen an issue which is taken up in that period, in that kind of a time period, as many management attention units in both NRC and uh, industry as the short-term operations tornado. We all agree it's not safety significant, but we can't figure out how to this position the issue. Um, that is causing us to widen our aperture and blur our focus on safety. So what do we do about that? Um, well, uh, in, enter the very low safety significance issue resolution process. Uh, and we're hoping still that we can address the short-term tornado operations uh, issue with that. We can bring our, our focus back to the, the, the red prize in the center. Uh, we can tighten the aperture. Uh, we can make these things work better together. We can, we can capitalize on the margins we now understand. And, and I think, you know, while we're going through some growing pains using the v Lisser process, if I'm allowed to use an acronym that convoluted, um, uh, you know, on the uh, tornado issue, uh, this is something we really need to become proficient on in the world of dry cast storage. Um, because, yeah, again, the, you know, I, I think Brian said it, how do you see risk informing like reactors? We've traditionally actually been less risk informed in dry storage, where we, we, we tr we've had more detailed uh, licensing bases, uh, more detailed uh, RAIs uh, when those licensing bases are under review than reactors, even though we've had these tremendous safety margins all along and we now understand them better. So I would really invite uh, my, my colleagues at NRC to engage in making uh, dry cast storage uh, a, a real uh, area, a, a test bed, an area of focus where we, we use this process uh, and, and maybe teach the rest of NRC a little bit because, um, you know, uh, this is important uh, in, every, in everything we're looking at that our lens be uh, tightly focused on safety and that we not be diverting our resources uh, with issues that are not important to safety. So now I come to the conclusion and uh, that will explain why this is important. Um, we uh, are living in a very dangerous world right now. I, I don't have to tell you that. Um, I actually uh, caught myself on the airplane to Phoenix thinking, well, what happens uh, if there's a nuclear war breaking out while I'm up here and I, my plane has no place to land? And then I told somebody at the conference that and they reminded me, oh, you don't have to worry about that the electromagnetic pulse will just cause your plane to fall from the sky. Um, so, okay, one less thing to worry about. But in this more dangerous world, and, and I would tell you that climate change is just as much an existential threat as Vladimir Putin, but um, it, you know, it's, it's a threat that comes at us uh, slower. And I, I, you saw a lot of data about that threat in the last session, if you were in on the, uh, the changing weather uh, session and, and kudos to NRC for putting putting that one together. Um, so whatever our existential threats are, uh, we have to have energy security to get through them. Uh, and that energy security has to be achieved without putting more carbon into the atmosphere. So out here at Phoenix, um, we've been talking a lot about the uh, fuel cycle issues of advanced reactors. And I was on a panel yesterday here where we talked about that. And there are a lot of challenges. You know, fortunately, we've got this experience base with dry cast storage of fuels that are pretty much the same across the board and very well understood. We've, we've really improved the materials in and around the casks as, as, as much as we can. And, and I'm sure 
uh, Kim, you'll continue to innovate to be more competitive. But, um, you know, uh, so, so we, we've gotten to a good place, but we're going to be challenged in the future um, uh, in, in terms of new fuel types, different types of materials we're going to have to use in these systems. If our aperture is blurry, if we're not tightly focused, if these circles are not close together, and if the outer circles are not thick and strong, um, we're going to struggle. And that's going to have a negative impact on industry's journey towards carbon-free energy. Not only will dry cast storage become difficult when these new fuels come out of the reactors, that's kind of far down the line, but um, public perception uh, will, uh, you know, well, they, these guys seem to not be uh, able to focus on safety here. People notice that. You know, when we're, when we're having these discussions in public, and I'm kind of breaking the fourth wall here a little bit, but um, you know, when we have these discussions in public and we're not aligned, on it, again, and, and, and these discussions, if they're not on things that are, are safety problems, why are we even having them? And, and then the third reason is, and I think this is the most compelling reason why it is important that we really use dry cast storage as an opportunity to hone our risk informing muscles is, is because, because we have uh, the understanding and, and the inherent safety of, of these systems with no moving parts, um, we, we, can, we can do more. We, we can use the V-Lisser process, for example, uh, more uh, than they can in the reactor side. We don't need PRAs, we can do it simpler. In short, dry cast storage, if we continue to sharpen our safety focus through what I would only call as qualitative risk informing, because I don't think, and, and, and Brian, you said it, do we really want to spend tens of millions of dollars doing dry cast PRAs? I don't think anybody in this session wants to, unless there's a, a, a real PRA fan in here somewhere, and I apologize to you if that's, if that's the case. So, you know, the survival of our planet uh, does rely on carbon-free energy and on energy security. Um, and we get that with a whole lot of really uh, cool advanced nuclear technologies. In order for these technologies to be successful, in order for them to be economically competitive, first of all, we can't have the back end tying us up. And, and second of all, we have to sharpen our focus, tighten our aperture across the industry in every aspect of the reactors and the fuel and the used fuel. So um, guys, we got a great opportunity here. So um, let, let, let's go and, and, and then let's do this. I, I look forward to uh, continuing to work with my uh, our colleagues in industry and, and NRC to drive uh, drive drive risk informing through the, the dry cast storage knowledge base we have. Um, and with that, I'll I'll conclude. And I guess we're taking questions at the end. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Rod, for a lot of uh, interesting concepts and challenges to the NRC. Uh, always appreciate it. Uh, we do have a few polling questions also at this point. Uh, if we could bring those up, or at least the first one. And do you think the use of engineering analysis is adequately reflected in PRA models? And of course, I would say, you know, this is always must. Uh, probably should be answered in a risk-informed way that you can always add more detail, but given the uncertainties, is there enough? see we have a lot of good risk analysts out there that it depends uh a lot of it is uh purpose of the analysis is always a key part of how is it adequate Tim, that speaks volumes yes interesting uh, could we go to the next question Do you think risk-informed decision-making for dry cast storage systems would benefit if PRA analyses were updated? Uh, 
And the last polling question for at this time. And here it's sort of where do you think the focus should be in terms of benefiting the most for updating? Certainly all of the above in handling and operational accidents are figuring prominently. Uh, that, that's a good lead in to our next speaker. And uh, Zeta Martin will be bringing her years of experience at the Tennessee Valley Authority to in her presentation that looks at uh, operational risks and concerns of handling, et cetera. Uh, Zita. Good morning. Um, uh, next slide, please. So I will I'll set up this uh, presentation with an introduction. Um, I'll walk you uh, through the years with uh, some experiences in Part 72 dry cast storage, uh, not used, uh, solving issues, not using a risk informed process. Uh, walk you through some uh, more recent experiences where risk was taken into account uh, in the solutions, uh, in arriving at the solutions, and uh, discuss a little bit of where do we go from uh, here as an industry with risk informed decision making. Uh, next slide. So two things my bio tells you. First of all, I'm old. And second of all, I've been, uh, I've seen the storage uh, side of the industry grow significantly. So with that in mind, uh, while the, there have been many changes um, over the span of my career, one thing remained constant. Uh, the goal is safety. And as uh, Tim mentioned uh, earlier, reasonable assurance of adequate protection is, is the goal. Um, safety is the main priority. Um, has been and always will be, uh, both nuclear safety and industrial safety. Um, utilities have to comply, however, with the letter of the law, which, you know, literal compliance, I'm sure everybody knows that term, uh, not just the intent, uh, which is safety. So utilities are required to comply with the regulations, so durable record is required. And what I mean by that is that we need some guidance, something to point to that says, this is, if you do this, you're, you're, you're going to meet the regulations and, and, and meet the letter of the law. Um, however, um, compliance sometimes leads to increased industrial risk or increased dose, um, as you'll see later. Next slide. So I'm briefly gonna go through a couple of, of issues that, have, that came up um, early on in the industry. Um, initially um, required, uh, burn up measurements were required in an initial version of an interim staff guidance um, to confirm reactor records prior to loading fuel and CAS. Um, burn up is an important parameter for design and, and loading of CAS as it relates to dose and heat loads. Um, However, industry argued on the basis of risk, burnup measurements added dose, time, and cost without a commensurate benefit to the health and safety of the public due to the accuracy of the already existing in core uh, measurements. However, and this is where communication comes into play, early in Part 72, NRC personnel had no Part 50 experience, but industry assumed they knew the Part 50 part of the operation and, and what we did to arrive at those burn up measurements. So there was, we were talking over each other essentially during a lot of the discussions and, and um, that is where you know, communication is, is key and continued open lines of communications between industry and NRC is, is key. Um, so SG8 Rev3 in uh, uh, 2012 contains the right solution. However, it took many years for the NRC and the industry 
to agree in 20 years for a durable record, which is the, uh, 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 I, I guess, um, in, encased in, in New Reg 2215, which wasn't uh, published till uh, mid-2020. So as you can tell, it took 20 years to resolve a relatively simple issue um, because we weren't really looking at, at, at the risk. Next slide. Another issue that, that came up um, in the early days was Westinghouse top nozzle stress corrosion issue. Issue was identified in, in 2001 at a utility stress corrosion cracking uh, basically affected the handling of uh, of fuel assemblies. The assemblies then then required modification for handling. The uh, discussion um, on how these uh, modifications, whether these modifications would be uh, could be loaded into into cast and ensued. Um, it took many years and many meetings uh, to come to a determination. The process to, to generate a durable record on what that conclusion was. Um, it was initiated in, in 2010. Again, you're, see, you're seeing a, a, a time span here where things take a long time to resolve. The durable record um, resulted in an, it was the NRC letter issued in 2012 with an official risk a regulatory issue summary um, published in, 23rd, in late 2013. So again, 13 years to resolve a relatively simple issue. Uh, the benefit of this was that NEI resurrected the regulatory issue resolution protocol the, or the re-rip process with a lot of success. The, this process has been successfully used for several issues since, and it keeps people focused on gaps and solutions uh, to the problem. Next slide. Uh, an early, another early experience uh, issue was uh, what we call stack up. Uh, the initial questions uh, by the NRC. So uh, I guess, you know, we fast forward about 10 years and, and, and we get to, to 2010 when the NRC starts asking questions about stack up um, and then officially issues a, a URI unresolved uh, uh, issue um, uh, document in, in early 2011. The um, Issue began with uh, questions on the analytical methods used for the unrestrained stack of configuration uh, during the loading process. Um, it was an issue of compliance. The uh, initial questions were about analytical methods related, uh, a different analytical method was used in the 5059 evaluation, evaluating the part 50 part of the plant and the 7248 evaluation, evaluating the, the dry storage side of the of the process and obviously the same methods uh, should be used in both so that's where the compliance issue uh, came in almost six years to resolve a compliance issue um, for basically the the process of, of stack up which is the transfer cask uh, being on top of the overpack to transfer the canister with the fuel down into the concrete overpack for storage outside the, the on on the fizzy pad so as I stated in slide three, um, compliance sometimes leads to increased industrial risk and increased dose, uh, meeting the letter of the law versus the intent, which the intent is safety. So until the issue was resolved, loadings performed with physical restraints um, uh, caused industrial safety concerns and increased dose because you had these monstrous um, restraints that had to be added uh, to make sure that during a seismic event, the cast would not tip over when the analysis showed that it would not, but still uh, because of the compliance issue, we were uh, required to do that if we were loading. Some loadings were canceled or delayed, causing additional problems for the utilities from the problem of you know, managing your pool. Um, and again, uh, all these things caused increased dose and, and, um, and time and, and, and planning. Um, what started out as a compliance issue resulted in the NRC prescribing what the analysis should look like. So risk, um, it was generated in, um, in 2015. It describes the seismic analysis details for uh, a stack up configuration. This is a, it resulted in a benefit in the sense that the risk provided guidance for the industry, but it took too long to resolve. Again, we're looking at, at, at a pattern here where it takes, you know, 10 or, or 
even longer in some cases, years to resolve a, an issue that uh, uh, that really was not a, a safety issue, but more of a compliance issue. Next slide. <clears throat> so fast forward another nine or so years and, and we get to the performance margin white paper that, uh, that uh, we've discussed already. The industry initiated this paper uh, in, uh, as a result of the uh, high burn up fuel demonstration project, uh, which provided uh, you know, very favorable results. The high burn up fuel demo loaded an instrumented cask and measured parameters inside the cask. The results showed large margins. Heat loads were significantly lower than predicted. So uh, as, um, uh, as Rod pointed out, we, we thought we you know, needed to take advantage of that, of that margin. Um, we sent, it to, uh, sent the, the white paper to the NRC. Uh, some of the recommendations in the white paper were uh, a graded approach. Uh, initiated some some of these graded approach or at least one one pilot was initiated earlier through the re-rip process um, and the other recommend another recommendation was to um, convene some perts um, those were the um, um, phenomena identification and ranking tables um, which uh, we had uh, four topics initially identified uh, to address in perch. And what the perch do is they rank the items or the characteristics based on the significance and impact uh, to safety. Um, what that results in is that the accuracy of less significant characteristics are less important. Again, it brings risk into the equation. Next slide. So going in a little more detail into the graded approach, two graded approach pilots um, were proposed uh, and initiated. So I said earlier, one had already been initiated through the re-rep process, uh, and that one was to improve the format and context of the, of the uh, certificate of compliance and the tech specs of, of the CAS systems. Um, that one um, basically reformatted and reduced the content or, 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 or tried to streamline the certificate and, and the tech specs. The second pilot, um, a great approach pilot, was, uh, was one that... Um, uh, aim to at alternative licensing strategies, again, based on the significance of the change. You make a small change, you, you add a fuel assembly type or something to that nature, and it may not require a, uh, as big a, a, of a review or detailed a review as if you, let's say, change the heat load uh, or increase the heat load of the, of the systems. Um, so the, although the initial effort was significant uh, here, since we were developing a, a new process, uh, I believe this will provide large benefits, uh, allowing us to concentrate on important items, um, as um, Rod has um, uh, you know, pointed out. Um, this allows for the appropriate level of effort for the CAS vendors and faster NRC reviews, depending on the significance of the change. So efficiency improvements for both the industry and the NRC. Next slide. Um, uh, the perts were four, four categories were initially um, uh, identified to perform perts on thermal, decay heat, fuel performance, and gross rupture, which I'll, I'll talk on the next slide. The uh, first meeting of the PERT teams was in October of 2019. Um, EPRI led the effort, and the, their reports on, on these perts were published in mid 2020. Now you can see where when we incorporate risk, how the time frame has has shrunk because we're concentrating, uh, not really worried about the insignificant stuff. We're we're concentrating on the uh, on the important things. And um, the the EPRI reports um, the perch identify substantial margins and opportunities for regulatory safety and operational benefits uh, using potential alternative fuel performance metrics. So uh, the the Perch identify potential relaxation of specific regulatory limits based on, on latest data. The um, options for use of margins uh, discussed by the industry was, it was also a result of, of the PERT in, in that it was, um, it, it, or should I say, as a result of the PERT, um, we, we think that there's other options for the use of margins. Um, the benefit to this is, again, faster NRC reviews, depending on margin to limit and increased operational flexibilities for utilities and the vendors. Um, efficiency improvements for both NRC and vendors due to the focus on risk or the impact to safety. 
again, if you look at this effort, relatively short period of time to come to the correct conclusions when we focus on risk. Next slide. <clears throat> so the fourth part was um, looked at gross rupture. The, um, <clears throat> the first meeting of the, uh, the intent was to define gross rupture to define what uh, fuel needs to be placed into individual cans before loading into, ca into cask. Um, you don't want something that's, that's um, falling apart to be placed into, into the can because obviously the vendors have to analyze some configuration. So the term gross rupture was, was developed. So the expert team determined that some level of fuel failure can, can be tolerated in canisters without compromising safety. So this led to developing a new metric for defining gross rupture. And as you can see, the new metric was uh, detection of transuranics in the RCS. If you detect transuranics, you have gross rupture, and then you have to look for which assembly has, has the gross rupture. The old metric, or should I say the current metric, because uh, I'm not sure that this has been implemented yet, is that the clad defect, um, it can be no greater than one millimeter. So as you can see, it's a, it's a vast improvement uh, based on safety. Um, the PERT report with recommendations was issued in, in December of 2021. So it took us a year to make this significant determination when we just looked at the risk and, and the safety of, of what we were doing. Um, the benefit is that there are significantly fewer assemblies required to be canned, basically place it in an individual can before we actually load it into the canister. Um, this saves utility significant time, cost, and dose because it's less work over the fuel, less work uh, uh, over the spent fuel pool. Uh, again, pointing out relatively short period of time to uh, come to the correct conclusions when we focus on risk. Next slide. <clears throat> so what, what should we concentrate on? Uh, when issues arise, uh, we need to ask, so what? What is the safety concern? Um, uh, advantage of my career is in, in both wet and dry storage um, is that I look at this as, as optimizing the cast loadings to benefit the part 50 spent fuel storage um, uh, side of the house uh, operation uh, in criticality, um, heat loads, et cetera. So when fuel issues arise, um, and large chunks of, of fuel, of the, your fuel populations are, is not available to load into canisters um, or uh, such as the top nozzle um, stress corrosion cracking issue or campaigns are delayed because um, or canceled such as with the stack up issue. Uh, this causes uh, real uh, problems in, in your plan and in your optimization of what you load. It can cause you to have um, campaigns that are higher in dose than they should be because you have to load hotter fuel. Um, you know, that's just a, one example of, of some of the impacts of, of these issues. So uh, the bottom line is that we must focus on items that impact safety. Uh, this will ensure the utilities and the NRC attention and resources are not diverted, but rather focused on the right things. Um, the quick resolution of significant issues when you focus is on safety. Um, we have come a long way in my 40 plus years uh, career in the industry and 20 plus years in the dry storage side of the house. Um, but in how we, and I, I say we, the NRC and industry approach issues and come to a resolution. And this is a good thing. Um, there's, there's good open lines of communication and discussions and, and, and honest and, and open lines of communication and discussion. And again, this is a good thing. Um, as long as we make decisions based on risk and the safety impact. So thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you, Zita, for some very interesting, uh, thoughts and viewpoints uh, from in an historical perspective. Uh, our final presentation is Kim Manzione and will give us uh, some perspectives with respect to industry-led topical reports. Kim.
Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the time here, so I'll, I'll try and, and do this <laughs> efficiently. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, topical reports and how Holtec has attempted to use them kind of in the Part 72 space. They've been used in Operating Reactors Part 50 world before. Um, they have not been used, at least not to any great uh, gr great lengths in the Part 72 world. The idea would be that these topical reports would increase the efficiency of our other licensing actions. So often when a vendor such as Holtec submits an amendment to our, our storage license, it's for a specific site that needs it for a specific loading and has a specific time frame. Um, and so this, the approach that we're taking in these topical reports is to hopefully move some of the risk informing type issues outside of that uh, amendment process that has a need and has a schedule and allows us to address them fully and then incorporate them into an amendment later. So I'm going to talk about two different topical reports that we've been working on over the past couple of years. So you can go to the next slide. The first one we submitted was a thermal topical report. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, spent fuel storage casts, they passively dissipate the heat um, from stored fuel. The, the underlying concern is to ensure that temperature limits of the fuel and the materials in the rest of the system remain within limits. Um, up till now, the NRC has reviewed these kind of individualized lo loading patterns, we'll call them, uh, in each COC amendment. Um, Holtec has been very involved in plant decommissioning, and as we were, we were supporting some of those plants, we determined that if you looked very specifically at the plant's fuel inventory, you could come up with a loading plan or two for that site specifically that would allow more optimal loading patterns. Um, and that, in terms of optimal, it's both reduces the time, the, the defueling time, so you can get pool, you can get fuel out of the pool quicker, as well as even lower dose. If you can correctly load the assemblies into certain locations, you can use some of the, the self-shielding of older, cooler assemblies to help shield the hotter, newer assemblies. So um, that, so you can get an optimization both in terms of dose to the workers, which obviously is a huge benefit, as well as speed, which is, is also good for getting the, the fuel out of the pool. Um, we, we realized very quickly that if we were going to introduce these through license amendments, that would be incredibly burdensome. Each site would have its own optimal pattern, and to start having to do an amendment for each individual site just seemed a little bit uh, overkill for both us and, and for the NRC and kind of defeats the whole purpose of the Part 72 general license process, which is to have this kind of overarching license that can be implemented at any site. So you can go to the next slide. So what we came up with was a generic method to establish allowable heat load patterns. So we set out specific acceptance criteria, which are risk informed because they are dealing with specifically the performance of the fuel, the performance of the system, those acceptance criteria are the underlying criteria that we try and meet, right? The heat load patterns that we put in the COC were always intended to meet these same acceptance criteria. So it's the same acceptance criteria we've already lose, we've always used, but that now is the end goal rather than just uh, meeting a heat load pattern. But the calculations to show how you how a site meets those acceptance criteria are left to the licensee, probably with the support of, of the vendor such as Holtec. Um, and, and so that's what I kind of outlined that this this really focuses on the risk, which would be a system component having a temperature outside what it is is rated for, what it is, what it's intended to perform to. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so we submitted uh, the thermal topical report in March, um, and, and this was a huge success, quite frankly, because we had a final SER by September of 2021. Um, that is faster than just about any amendment I've ever been a, a part of uh, in my nearly 10 years at Holtec. So um, I really credit to the NRC staff for prioritizing this and working with us. Um, it was an approach that was already based on what staff had reviewed in our, our generic FSARs. So it wasn't necessarily a significantly new technical uh, details to review, but it, it still all credit to the staff for working with us. We also utilized um, something that, that the staff was calling regulatory audits. Um, and what that allowed us to do was have our technical experts sit with the technical reviewers and talk through questions before RAIs were issued. And so that, that when we went to respond and we went to provide the technical information the, the the two sides technical had already talked together and knew exactly kind of what everybody was looking for and what we were able to provide um so want to really give the staff a lot of credit for for that kind of review 
Um, but then I'll go to the next slide and talk about a few of the challenges we've had now with this topical report. Um, so the way Part 72 works is the only way a site can implement something under a general license is if it is in our COC. And so we have to roll this into a COC amendment, which essentially says, please follow the method in the topical report if you'd like to develop your own loading pattern. That, simply that is what it says. Um, the NRC has informed us that they expect a roughly 22 month review time of this amendment to incorporate a topical report that they have already reviewed and approved. And so I think we have a few concerns on our side just about is that really an efficient use of everyone's time um, to spend that money mo many months reviewing something that is already technically complete. And the difficulties that we're kind of running into is, is more an implementation process. And this kind of aligns with what, what Zita was saying in terms of some of the issues that take us a very long time are these kind of compliance issues. And, and we need to find a better way to address those because they aren't safety significant. Um, and so one of the ones that we keep stumbling on is a, is a 7248 and change control provisions. Part 72 has a description already in it of how to do change control. Um, but with the introduction of the topical report, uh, there have been some struggles with NRC staff in trying to figure out, uh, are we still allowed to use the change control process that's already outlined in part 72? Um, so, so on our end, we're, we're really struggling with, I guess, why this is a, a new, um, a new problem to solve when, when maybe we thought it was already solved. So I, I think there's not a lot of I think we're struggling with the risk informing on that side in that the technical approach has already been reviewed and approved, but the the implementation and the compliance and the change control of it is what is now going to take twice as long as, as really the technical part. Uh, so then I'll go on to the next slide and say we took some of the lessons we learned from the topical report uh, and then also wanted to roll them into this shielding topical report, which kind of has been alluded to earlier in some of the talks. Um, Again, one of the underlying uh, safety functions of the systems is to provide shielding for the fuel that's stored within. Um, the current uh, COCs have some very complicated fuel qualification tables. Sometimes it's, it's an equation, sometimes it's a table, but we'll just call them FQTs for, for convenience. Um, and they establish allowable combinations of burn-up, enrichment, and cooling time. So you can go to the next slide. Um, but again, the underlying criteria that we have here is the dose rates, right? It doesn't particularly matter how, what the enrichment of a fuel assembly is if the dose that it's giving off to either the worker or the public is extremely minimal, right? It's not the combination that I care about, it's, it's what's, what's the actual um, risk to a worker or to the public. Um, and so we developed a topical report that risk informs the process, again, by focusing on that acceptance criteria. The dose rate is the acceptance criteria. Um, we would subject that acceptance criteria to NRC review, and then licensees, again, would have the ability to do the calculation to determine the combination of fuel that meet those criteria. So you can go to the next slide. Um, we submitted this uh, in May of of uh, this year as a generic for the whole industry. It's not specific to whole tech systems. It's currently under review by NRC. We're hoping the review will be done this year. Um, the current challenge on this one, and, and again, it kind of goes back to risk informing, is that the, the RAIs we have gotten and responded to on this ask for a significant level of detail, even beyond, in some cases, what's already in the FSARs and the COCs that exist today. Um, and so, if we are going to be so overly prescriptive in the methodology and, and not allowing any changes, right? That if the underlying concern is the dose rate, we, again, at, at Holtec and I think throughout the industry are struggling with some of the limitations imposed um, by the questions in this top of the report. It, it doesn't give us any sort of flexibility and we might as well just have the field qualification tables in there um, if it's going to be so prescriptive that those combinations can't change regardless of what the dose rate is. So I'll go to the last slide and hopefully I caught us up a little bit on time. Sorry if I'm talking too quickly. Um, so the topical reports, um, we, we've certainly seen a benefit in terms of the risk informed reviews, right? It has very much allowed us to focus on the underlying safety criteria, the temperature limits, the, the dose rates, which 
which are the underlying safety criteria for everything that is written in our COCs and FSARs. But we haven't yet been able to gain that efficiency in reviews that we were really hoping to gain. Um, implementing a top report into the COC seems to be an extreme difficulty um, that we were not really expecting. Um, and then these kind of limitations that, that have been put on that seem to go against the principle of focusing on the underlying safety criteria, um, they, they've really limit, limited the usefulness of these topical reports. Um, so one of the things, and I'm, I don't expect an answer, I'm just throwing this up there today, is, is maybe this, maybe topical reports isn't the right way to go. Maybe this is something that we should be doing just as part of our COCs. Uh, maybe rather than doing a thermal topical report, we, we should have just built into the COC in the first place. If it's going to be a two-year review cycle, maybe I should have just built it in there in the first place. Um, in the COC, define the actual safety metric that we are trying to hit instead of trying to do these surrogates of fuel qualification tables, of heat load patterns, and, and define that just up front in the COC. Um, this is something that we proposed very early on in the thermal topical report discussion, and, and we sort of got directed and, and that's fine in the, in the way of the topical report, um, but maybe it's something that we need to revisit as we look at these kind of the graded approach that's going on in the risk informing. Maybe it's something that we need to look at. Is this kind of focus on the underlying safety criteria something we can just build into the COC? Um, so just a food for thought as, as we kind of go forward from someone who's spent a lot of time talking about topical reports in the last couple of years. Um, and that's the last thing I had on my slides. So I think that's it for me, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Kim, for catching us up to a degree. Uh, uh, I apologize for you having to, you talk very fast, but, but it was very clear. Uh, I, I, I guess just, I mean, we may be able to get to one question, but I would like to point to a phrase that former Chairman Savinicki used a few years back, and she called it the frustratingly ponderous path, pace of, of the regulatory process. Uh, she did not mean it as criticism, as much as a recognition that things move very slowly and deliberatively. But I will say that's why risk informing is an evolving process. Heard a lot of good things today. Uh, continued discussion can only benefit that. And I think we all want to be more efficient. And uh, with that, I know we don't have much time, but uh, could we bring up a, a question or two? And I'm not, at, at least I have not, uh, I can't see any comments, but, ah, here's one. Will the NRC update dry cast story transportation PRA studies using updated Melcor modeling to estimate canister to environmental release fractions? Uh, will these updated studies consider aging degradation as a new failure mechanism? And I'll, I'll say that probably, uh, if Brian, if you could take a, uh, 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 that comment about updating the uh, uh, using Melcor? I was afraid you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, the answer is I don't know. Um, we, I, I mean, uh, I know we're always updating Melcor modeling in general. Um, I'm not uh, super involved in the transportation PRAs. Um, you know, we did just, did just do one in 2014, so I'm not sure if we're, if we have another one in the pipeline yet. Um, so yeah, but I mean, obviously the cancer and environmental release fractions are an important aspect um, and we want to do, get the best estimate of those that we can given the, the data that's available. That's, of course, that's all I've got on that. Uh, th thank you, Brian, yes. And, and uh, certainly in that comment that estimating the release of material from a canister is a very important aspect and the studies to date have carried with it a number of assumptions. Uh, and so it is important to the extent uh, we can update things. Uh, Rod, you have your hand raised. Yes, Tim, and I don't want to comment on Melcor, but I, I do want to go back to your quote of uh, uh, 
Chairman Savinicki, uh, she was dedicated throughout her term to making the process less ponderous. Yes, we must recognize it's ponderous for a reason, but we also must recognize for nuclear energy to be a competitive way to decarbonize and stabilize our planet, that we have to become less ponderous. And I just want to use that as an opportunity to reiterate that dry cast storage is an excellent place to flex our muscles, to, to strengthen our muscles in this regard. I appreciate that. Uh, we have another question that we may have a little bit of time. Well, no, we do not. Uh, uh, I don't know if we can continue. Uh, can we go a little bit over? I don't know if that's possible. Okay. Uh, there was a question about uh, how do members of the panel see risk insights being applied to the transportation of, of spent nuclear fuel and high level waste. And uh, I'll, I'll go with, uh, let's just go around the table. Uh, uh, I, I'll go first. I, I, I think it's always useful to look at uh, the risks associated with uh, transportation. The, the, there have been some recent risk studies. Uh, they also, uh, estimating the amount of release uh, from a severe accident is one of the more dominant assumptions and parameters, uh, but it, it is uh, uh, certainly similar to dry cast storage. Transportation casts have been shown to be very reliable and robust, and it takes a very significant uh, accident to cause any release. Uh, I'll turn to Brian. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than that's something that we've thought about a little bit and um, might look into doing perhaps in a similar vein of the, the risk tool. Because, um, yeah, I think some of the same principles apply that we see, uh, you know, kind of uh, we've seen that there may be some margin there. Um, we've got to be, of course, careful. Um, but there might be some places where we can take advantage of some of that margin. Yeah, Tim, I, I, I can weigh in on that. And I think it goes back to what you said at the beginning about the experience base. We have uh, 1,300 shipments of used fuel conducted in the United States. Uh, I believe most of those regulated or many of those regulated by NRC. Uh, and if we start shipping to interim storage or repository, which I believe we should, and the former sooner rather than later, um, you know, we're going to, that experience base is going to grow. And I think it's going to give us what, you know, as that experience base grows, we're going to have more well-defined answers to what you said, Tim, which is that you're not going to have a significant release. Um, I, I think that being able to, to demonstrate that and act on that is, is, is important because transportation, a large-scale transportation campaign makes railroads nervous. They're not nervous because they think they're dangerous. They know that much other cargo is way more dangerous than spent fuel. But they're nervous because they're, you know, they're thinking, well, these dedicated trains, uh, they, they might mess up our efficient commerce. And if our regulatory framework uh, for transportation is efficient, I think uh, we, we're actually reducing the possibilities for, you know, delays and concerns to uh, choke commerce. Um, so I, I think it's important to our nation's rail commerce that we do learn from the experience base when we start a large scale shipping campaign. Uh, thank you, Rod. And if I could, let's go to one more question and then I think it would be appropriate to wrap up. I apologize to not getting to all the com comments, but uh, this one, are there general findings being seen for long-term storage of spent fuel at decommissioned reactor sites? And might these change? And what efforts are focused on revisiting these conclusions? And certainly long-term storage is a fact of, of the current situation in the US. Aging management programs are in place that continue to look for add information to support that the safety relevant structure system and components continue to function as they're intended. And so I'm not aware of any information to date coming out of aging management programs that would suggest 
any of the uh, conclusions from dry cast storage have changed. Uh, however, uh, I'm happy to hear any of the other uh, panel members to provide perspectives on that. Uh, I think aging management is the key. And I'll point out that every 40 years, and hopefully we're not extending licenses for multiple periods of 40 years, at least at the decommission sites, we might do that at an interim site. But, um, you know, it, it is, we will have to look at what our aging management programs, which are quite sophisticated, again, thanks to Kim and, and her colleagues in the industry, we have the ability to continue to extend our assurance and safety if, if we need be through aging management, uh, the technologies we've brought to bear already. And I'm thinking decades down the road, those technologies will be even more sophisticated. Yes, uh, agreed, Rod. I mean, that's part of, when I speak of risk informing, it continues to evolve, both what kinds of programs we have and, and, and what information, what it's telling us, aging management programs 20 years ago weren't there. <laughs> no one was doing that. Today they are with just that goal of, of we want to continue to ensure that safety is maintained. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future <laughs> clearly, but I think it, it is appropriate that the, the information continues to be collected. We continue to analyze it to under, better understand what, if any, issues might arise in the future. And I would just point out that, yes, we do have agent management programs. And um, as I mentioned for the CISCC, there's at least one example of where we're looking at how that would affect our, our PRA results and what our PRA results tell us about those, um, uh, those corrosion issues. And with that, I, I would just like to end the session today. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the views from all our panel members, comments, the polling questions, uh, and emphasize again that risk informing evolves. And uh, I, I think, uh, I know at NRC, I think we all come to work. We can do better and be it, be it more efficient, be in a different focus, whatever. And, and that's that evolving nature of risk informing. Uh, we need to uh, continue to challenge ourselves and to be a better regulator. And with that, I, I would like to ask if any of the uh, panel members want to say any concluding remarks themselves, just raise your hand. Uh, I think, okay, my, my panel members are comfortable with that, it, possibly as a concluding remark. I really wanna appreciate everyone's attendance at this uh, and very much appreciate, once again, the views that at least cause us at NRC to think harder and think about everything we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim.